thank you for coming. I think it's a great topic. Hey, hey, um, Tim, I didn't ask you. You're all all organized here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That usually when he's flipping the switches, that means I'm ready to go. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, <coughs> please remember to. Uh, uh, fill out the program or the, the attendance record and, and, and we don't have a program evaluation today That's why you got the audience response system clickers if you can stay around for a couple seconds after the program to uh, Provide us with some feedback on the program. We'd appreciate that uh, Today I have the pleasure of uh, introducing dr. Gregory Welk Dr. Uh, Welk is professor of kinesiology at Iowa State University. He uh, did his undergraduate training at the University of Illinois uh, in Champaign and then got a master's at the University of Iowa and then uh, his PhD did his PhD work at Arizona State um, He's been extensively published in the arena of uh, exercise wellness and fitness and uh, uh, We're very pleased that he was able to accept the invitation from the CME committee today to uh, provide us with a, a talk his uh, Talk is exercises medicine objective tools for assessment and promotion of physical activity and uh, please join me in uh, welcoming dr. Welk Thanks. Great. Uh, happy to be here. Um, I've been around Ames for 15 years or more, and I uh, really appreciate the chance to share some of what I do and, uh, at the university. I'm not too far away from all of you here, and I, I really am uh, very much interested in community connections and collaborations and have, uh, would welcome any uh, further dialogue as, as appropriate. Um, so yeah, the, the topic uh, that I'll be speaking on is something that's uh, very pas a passion for me. Um, so if I start editorializing too much, you'll have to apologize or you know accept my apology for it. So um, I get very excited about the topic and hope to share you know what's possible and and some of where things are going with regard to objective tools. So if the title, if the subtitle "Objective Tools for Assessment and Promotion of Physical Activity" doesn't catch your attention, I'll be talking about Fitbits and uh, various gadgets that are now widely used in research, and then they're al also their potential for clinical applications. Um, and the, the header title of Exercises Medicine is also not a, a name that I made up. It's a, a national and international initiative designed to try to get uh, broader connections of exercise into the, the medical care system. And again, that's where a lot of my passion uh, plays in. So I'll fo first focus on um, an overview of Exercises Medicine and then cover the different uh, technologies that have been uh, available for monitoring physical activity and um, start with more research grade monitors, move into consumer monitors, and then move, meet even move into um, new um, disposable patches that are now available for clinical applications. So that, I think, will be very new. Some of you might have heard of the, the various gadgets that exist, and a lot of medical systems are trying to figure out how to incorporate them into practice or how to refer people to them. Um, but these patches are sort of designed with clinical applications in mind, and so they're really exciting. Um, and actually, a, a colleague that I work with from this company is going to be here in Ames visiting with me on Tuesday, so there's even a chance for follow-up if people are interested or if there's a chance to set up a meeting. Um, and the third uh, point would be about behavior change applications, and um, I do work using these devices, but in a health coaching framework where we um, train uh, people using motivational interviewing to use the information from the devices. So just having a monitoring device is ne not necessarily going to help you change your behavior. Um, you sort of need to know how to take that information and use it and apply it. And so I'll have the preliminary findings. These are from a, a earlier trial we did, and we have another study currently going on um, that we just finished in the fall, and we're starting another cohort in the spring. So we have a lot going on in this area. Um, so again, I'll start off with uh, um, exercise as medicine, but I first want to introduce my lab. Um, this is, these are the students that help me do the work that I do, and um, without them, I can't do most of it. Um, so that I have a really uh, dynamic and energetic group of students that help um, carry all this work forward, and uh, that's what makes my, my job kind of enjoyable. Um, so in terms of the title, again, Exercise as Medicine is not a, a name I came up with, but it's an initiative of the American College of Sports Medicine, which is the leading professional group for kinesiologists like myself. Um, and that's their logo at the top. Um, but we've actually, we have a local program that we've called Exercise, and, and they can't spell um, exercise the way we can here in Ames. So, um, we have fun with that um, mantra, and you might have heard of our exercise team. We do um, things in the community. We're involved with um, pro promoting physical activity for the schools with um, ACPC. Um, we also do some senior programming at Green Hills and um, try to get the seniors up and moving, and um, we have a number of initiatives we're involved with. Um, the students also connect with Healthiest Ames on some things, so we're a an outreach group that is promoting physical activity and fitness, um, but we also are very interested in the, the broader applications of having our hub 
facilitate any connections with the, the big um, exercises of medicine initiative or the, the national one. Um, so again, we're a, a fun out, um, outreach group um, through the lab that I run, but, um, we, and we I'd encourage you to visit that website as well as the, the exercises medicine main website. Um, so these are, I'll start off with some uh, fun slides, and these are ones I use in classes, but I think they'll resonate with maybe some of you. So um, this is a you know, doctor saying, Mr. Big, you have sedentary death syndrome. And he says, oh, good, my wife just uh, claims I'm fat and lazy. And so the, 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 real, the reality is that there is such a thing as a sedentary death syndrome, and, and the evidence is overwhelming that inactivity is causally related to um, a number of chronic conditions and that being physically active can help reverse those. And so this is just an example. There's not really something called sedentary death syndrome in your medical dictionaries, but I wish there would be. Um, and again, that shows the, the, the way that, that, that inactivity is not valued or in, uh, endorsed by society. People downplay the importance. Um, and I'd love for exercise to become, um, have the same social norming influence that, for example, cigarette smoking now has. You, all of you probably remember uh, years ago when smoking was socially acceptable and now it's um, not, and that's helped move people away from smoking. And it'd be nice if the norm for physical activity was the same and that it was a social stigma if you were inactive or if you were lazy. But right now it's plenty fine to call yourself a couch potato, admit that you're lazy, admit that you're inactive, and I think we need to change that um, by having a different norm. Um, so I, th I highlight this um, article in, in Time. Um, so they actually took the, uh, it's a really good article if you have a chance to go look at this, but the title doesn't do it justice because there is no myth about exercise. They, they have a little subtitle there that says, of course it's good for you, but it won't make you lose weight. Why it's what you eat that really counts. And it, it frustrates me to no end that, you know, when people talk about the obesity epidemic or um, these other conditions that often inactivity or exercise is not even mentioned. All, we, all they talk about is eating too much and how we're inact or overeating and uh, the problems with fast food and sugar, but very few people in those reports often highlight the other side of the energy balance equation, which is physical activity. Um, and, and actually, if, you, if people read the article, they did a good job of describing that physical activity will um, provide protection against the health risks of obesity. It may not make you thinner as fast as you'd like, but the reality is that even if you're overweight, you can be healthy if you're active. And so it's more powerful than losing weight because it'll provide the power to help people be healthy regardless of what their body type is. And so to me, that's the real message. It's not there's a myth. It's actually it, they missed an opportunity to really uh, share that vision with people. Um, so to get a little more levity in here, I'm going to also take the liberty to have you watch a little video clip that's one of my favorites. Um, <coughs> I, I can honestly say I've watched that about a hundred times and it still makes me laugh, so I don't know. So, um, But the, the reality is that, that that is pretty common. Would you, many of you agree? So that people would take the escalator instead of the stairs, and, and if you don't believe me, the, the, I have proof. Um, so this is what you see um, at, at various places. There's this nice wide swath of stairway, and people will herd themselves like cattle to get on that uh, small escalator. Um, and I, I kind of buy into the fact that escalators do work because they help move you vertically, and that, that's a, a good thing. But the people movers in the airport are my bigger frustration, and I would challenge all of you to swear off people movers for the rest of your life. Just say no. Just don't do it. Anyone with me? Just say no. And again, I think it takes the social norm to get people to stop doing the, the, that behavior. Um, the perfect example, and I'll challenge all of you again, you might not see the people mover next, but next time you're at an airport, go look, and you'll see people um, walking on these people movers, and they'll say, oh, well, I walk while I do it, too. Well, why not walk on your own? 
can walk faster, right? Um, but how many of you are familiar with Des Moines Airport? I'm sure all of you, right? And what do you see? You see the two escalators on the side? I'm the one that's walking up the stairs in the middle. You won't see anyone else do it, but I'm trying, right? So is anyone willing to, next time you're in the airport, walk up the middle, carry your bag, you know, do a little weightlifting at the same time, and um, you know, that's the kind of normative. And so what I hope is that maybe if people see me do it enough that you know, I steer over to the stairway, maybe just one person will say, huh, look at that. You know, that guy took the stairs. I wonder if I should, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, that's, that's what I think about. And um, the, the vision that I think we need in society is to get more people choosing to be active, but it's hard, obviously. We live in a sedentary environment. We have challenging uh, work lives and that force us to be sedentary and lack of time and a ho whole host of other things. But um, the power of physical activity is, is truly, um, it truly is medicine. Um, and this is a, a slide that's um, probably one of the most highly cited studies in our field by Steve Blair, a colleague of mine, and it's 25 years old, and, and there's been numerous studies that have replicated this, but this shows the um, all-cause mortality of, uh, by fitness quintile, and so they divide people with a, a large sample of thousands of people that have gone through structured exercise testing, and the group in the bottom quintile has a 3.5% 3, 3 greater risk of dying of, or of all-cause mortality compared to any of those other quintiles. So you see, you don't have to be a marathoner in the purple, but you do have to get out of that bottom quintile to have some protection against health. And that's why the physical activity recommendations are fairly modest. If you do 30 minutes a day, you know, get out for a walk every day, that's enough. But the problem is we can't even get um, most of America to do that. Um, we're not telling people you have to sweat and breathe hard. You just have to get out and move and get um, 30 minutes of physical activity most days of the week would, give you, would get you out of that bottom quintile. And again, most people know this, they know they should exercise, but what most people aren't aware of is that it even corrects for the risk of obesity. So most people say, yeah, that's those thin people, or you just have to avoid being overweight. Um, but this basically takes the same um, comparisons, fit versus unfit, so comparing the bottom quintile versus everybody else as fit versus unfit, but then it stratifies the results by lean, normal, and obese. And the, the main message here is that regardless of your obesity status, if you're fit, the dark purple line, your relative risk is relatively low. If you're inactive um, or unfit, regardless of your body type, you're at greater risk. And so there's been numerous studies that have confirmed this. It's not just with obesity or all-cause mortality. It's with diabetes. It's with cancer. It's with a whole host of other conditions that show that exercise or physical activity, physical fitness will provide protection against the health risks of obesity. So it truly is a, a very powerful um, health benefit for people that, again, I think is underappreciated. And so that's sort of the, the mission of um, the exercise as medicine movement is to start getting that, that initiative to take root. Um, so what you might say, well, what about quality of life? So I know exercise is good for health, but does it make you feel better, live longer, or, you know, more quality to your years? And it does that too. Um, so there's actually a randomized controlled trial that put people into different groups of, of doses of exercise and followed up for different indicators over time. So it was a well done randomized controlled trial. People were put into four different categories of dose, with the lowest being um, no exercise and the others being various doses. And they found changes in physical health that made sense, dose, clear dose response there. The more exercise you get, better change in physical health. Change in mental health, clear dose response effect with more physical activity, better health outcomes. And the last category was change in energy, so it helped people feel better, sleep better, um, have more energy, a whole host of other things compared to what people in the control group get. And again, there's countless other studies. These are just some that, that I chose to highlight, and I don't want to get too, uh, beat that drum too hard. Um, so I really wanted to just share that and share the vision of um, what, what's needed. So this is one of my favorite slides where the doctor's saying, exercise, exercise, exercise. And he says, yes, yes, now seriously, what can we really do to improve our health? So, and you may have patients like this that don't want to hear that story, that they want to hear the, that there's some other alternative, some drugs that they can take, some simpler way to exercise, but how much simpler can it really get than going out for a 15-minute walk in the morning and a 15-minute walk at lunch, or you know, doing some yard work? How, how much easier can we make it on people to get health benefits from physical activity? Um, I don't know. So you don't even have to call it exercise. Call it physical activity. And getting more people to move um, is really the key. Um, so this is a propaganda from Exercises Medicine. So they have a pair of shoes there. And they say, what if there was one prescription that could prevent and treat dozens of diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity? Just, you know, what if there was? And so the whole point of this, obviously, is that there is one medicine, and it's exercise. 
and that, that's where that initiative is going. And I, I strongly encourage you to go visit the, the website and take a look at the links. It's very powerful stuff. There's whole medical systems jumping on board with this Kaiser Permanente, and I think it's more the Denver mountain region that has fully jumped on board, and there's trials um, coming out that show um, the long-term outcomes of this. It's um, linked to the benefits that the new Affordable Care Act is providing for groups. So there's all kinds of opportunities there, and I'd be happy to um, connect or facilitate links to the group because I work with the ACSM on, on this initiative. Um, so again, uh, that's my intro there. Um, within this, the, the real goal of exercise as medicine is to make exercise part of the vital sign. Um, so in addition to other things that are tracked electronically in the medical record, um, ideally, um, it'd be great if um, physical activity could be included because you saw that there's powerful effects. So we'd want to have that tracked. We'd want to know were people active in the last six months? Um, are they typically active? What's their general level of activity? And the questions can be um, debated. We can come up with some kind of question that could be included. Um, but there's basic questions that could be included um, as to incorporate that construct into the EMR. And then the goal would be to have some reference of that by the physician to reference the, the need to be active as a reminder, because the, the people, the patients will listen. Um, so we just need to build it into the process. Um, so again, I'd encourage you to visit exercisesmedicine.org, um, and uh, I think you'll like what you see there. All right, so I'm going to move on into um, other topics that maybe give tools for doing this. So how can we, uh, if we know that exercise is important, how do we get people to take advantage of it? And I thought I'd highlight uh, the new interest in this, and you, during the Christmas holidays, most of you probably saw people um, swap, grabbing up these to give them to their friends and family, and, and many of you probably have these devices, I'm willing to bet, some. Okay, so uh, again, I think they're uh, a new trend, and um, I've been doing work with physical activity monitors for years, but the, the recent movement of these devices as consumer, um, for the consumers is relatively new, um, but it, it came about when, um, actually, the, when the Wii um, device that, you know, the gaming system came about, and that drove the price of accelerometers down and made it possible to put all this power into smaller and more powerful devices, but we've been using accelerometry-based devices for 20 years, um, for research, but um, the price was too high and they were bulky, and so that kind of drove the price down, and you know, now we're seeing all kinds of innovation. It's one of the hottest things in, um, in consumer technology these days. You've seen the ads for both iPhone and Samsung that are highlighting not just does their phone work, but what health gadgets do they have on it, and you know, they've, they've put a whole stake in this. So this is a very popular topic. There's whole conferences now devoted to sensor technology and, and how it's going to change um, the healthcare system, so it's a really exciting area. Um, we're only dabbling in um, our work on you know, some consumer um, studies on this, and I'll show a few of those, and then I'll move into um, how it could be linked to health coaching. Um, so this is a, more of a technical model of, of how physical activity assessment fits within this whole world of, of health outcomes research. So I told you that you know, we know that physical activity relates to health, and so there's links, we have to be able to measure it to be able to determine how much activity is beneficial. And so that's what that arrow is. But then the, all these other arrows and boxes are really important. So we also, not just me, but the field does work on monitoring how active people are. What are the correlates that determine behavior? What are the theories that underline how to get people to be active? And then how do we use those theories to put them into practice and interventions to change behavior? So that's the behavioral epidemiology framework that, that comes out of our, our field. Um, so again, but physical activity assessments in the middle because we need really good measures of physical activity and this has been the predominant area of my work over the past 20 years. Um, so I'll, I could show you lots of gadgets and monitors but I, I chose to just highlight a few and I'm going to shift more towards the consumer monitors. Um, but this is a, a monitor that uh, I've, I've used and probably in my opinion is the most accurate. It's the body media device and actually you might not have heard of this one but if you've watched The Biggest Loser, the, the monitor was used on The Biggest Loser which might lead you to question, is that really the best monitor? But it really is, in my opinion, probably the strongest um, device. And the reason it um, has advantages is in addition to an accelerometer, so you can kind of see the, it has multiple sensors. So as part of these, it has an accelerometer in it that measures movement. And that's what most of these other consumer gadgets have, is they measure acceleration. But it also has heat-related channels. So heat flux, galvanic skin response, temperature. So even if you're standing still, if you're lifting weights or, move, or doing other things with your upper body, it can capture that increased energy cost because it sees the body getting warmer. 
And so it, it provides better, um, richer data that gives more accurate estimates of energy expenditure and physical activity. And we've done a number of studies using this device, and um, it's still widely used in our, in our work. Um, I thought I'd share a couple, uh, again, techie figures here just to give you some sense of what's going on. So most of you would know that if you're biking, your hip's not moving. So if you're wearing a, a device on your hip, or if, if, my, if the armband's on my arm and I'm biking, my arm's not moving, right? So the acceleration can't detect that I'm doing anything. And so this just shows that the heat flux in yellow when I started biking was spiked, right? So the, the sensor was picking up increased heat, um, and that's corresponding with the green line that's showing energy expenditure. So the acceleration signals are really low, and they're, they're not, because I'm not moving at those periods, but it's capturing the heat flux. And I, I like to show this just to show you, you know, how it works. And you'll notice that it, it can tell in this line here that physical activity was occurring here because I'm biking. And then when I'm in my office or doing other things, it's showing that no physical activity is happening. And that's more clearly indicated in this um, next slide. Um, this, I, I chronicled this on myself again a long time ago, and I've kept using the slide, but yeah, I was doing little bursts of walking. I lifted some weights. I sat at my desk. I drove, and then I played some baseball catch in my yard with my sons. And so you can see the, the heat flux corresponds with when I was lifting weights, for example, and when I was um, walking back out to my car. So even this little spike here, it can capture that I moved out to the car, and then I drove. And so you're, you're capturing the spikes and ca playing baseball catch it's sensitive enough to detect these variations in energy expenditure. Um, and again, the, the body media is just one of many companies that's doing this, and there's, it just shows the power or the, the way these multiple sensors are, are being used. Um, so we've done a number of different studies with indirect calorimetry, with doubly labeled water, which is sort of the criterion measure of energy expenditure, um, and also free living studies. And I'll just highlight a couple examples here. I, um, again, I'm not, I, I'd rather shift gears to the consumer, but I thought I'd give you this um, the, sort of the research side of this first. Um, so this is the results of one study we did with doubly labeled water, which people drink the radio labeled water, and they, we measure energy expenditure over a two-week period. And so we had people wear armbands for a two-week period. And the error, the total error with the, the newer device, the Mini, was within 22 calories on average, which is just remarkable per day. So that means, on, that's again, on average, averaged across two weeks, across all the participants, but it's remarkably close. Um, the mean absolute percent error, if you take into account individual variability and some overestimation, some underestimation, was 8%, which is better than anything else that's been shown. So that's pretty decent. 8% um, error would mean if you're burning 2,000 calories, you're, you know, it's within 180 on either end or so. So you know, it's less than 1,800 to 2,200, and that's about the precision that you'd, you'd get out of any of the devices, and this is the best case scenario. So I wanted to at least share that um, to give you the, the benchmark there. Um, then we've tested it against other research grade monitors, and the core armband was the only one that gave uh, an accurate estimate of um, the criterion measure um, over this extended free living protocol. So this is just an equivalence test that we did um, to compare, and this one's called the core armband. So they keep changing the size of these devices as well. Um, but I thought I'd again share the, the progression in research on these, um, these devices. Um, but the, the real key is that research now continues to explore ways to improve the accuracy and usability of them. So we keep trying to make them smaller and better. And again, the consumer products are now um, have innovated on their own and, and have moved ahead of what even some of the research devices have done. Um, so it's interesting to see um, how the technology has moved in that regard. Um, so this is just a smattering of several different um, devices, and the key question that people always ask is, you know, do they work? Should I buy them? And um, actually, when we've done this work, we did a fairly modest consumer study that I'll show you, and it probably is the study that I've done that's grabbed the most media attention. So once it got picked up by the local media, then others picked it up, and um, it's been a popular topic, um, and we get interviewed um, on this fairly regularly. Um, so again, the, the most of the these consumer monitors have a lot of features in common, and consumers are struggling figuring out which one they should get. Um, most of them, all of them, have a sen an accelerometer sensor that is measuring the movement, but it's, it can't measure um, activity directly. It has to take that raw movement and calibrate it into some indicator or try to capture, and, and most of the devices get pretty good at detecting locomotor movement, so it can detect the repeating nature of accelerations if you're walking and if you're running it's going faster, so it can tell that that's um, a locomotor activity, but it's higher intensity. But that's about it for most of the gadgets. They, they can't 
um, tell if you're playing racquetball or tennis. They're, they're just, they, they can tell that you're moving and that involves some locomotor, but they would be less accurate for um, activities that you're doing with your arms or not moving about. So it's a good locomotor movement device, and most of them capture steps as well as um, calories or energy expenditure. Um, but they, they also, um, some of them now are including inclinometers, which can tell if you're moving up a hill. And actually, some of them have gyroscopes, which um, most of you don't realize that in your cell phone, you have an accelerometer built in. And there's gyroscopes that tell if the tilt of your phone. Um, and so there's a lot of work now moving that a lot of the features that people are wearing on their wrist, we have all that technology in our pockets already. Um, and there's a lot of movement now that that's where a lot of this will go. And you've seen the iPhone or the, the Apple Watch um, has an interface to your phone, but your phone has an accelerometer and, and can do the same things. It's just that it's a convenient place for people to see their data and gives another way to display it. Um, so there's a lot of movement in, in integrating with cell phones as well. But most of them have uh, different functions and integration with smartphones. Um, and this is a summary paper a group my students did that compared these different devices, and we put it in a consumer-oriented uh, journal, more of a fitness uh, professional journal because they get asked the question, you know, which gadget should I buy? And so this is in a health and fitness journal um, if you're interested in that. But most of the devices that we wrote in here have, um, are, are now not even commercially available. The study came out in 2014 and most of the devices have, you know, already been replaced by newer monitors. Um, but in this particular study, you'll notice on the left, we compared this armband monitor. So we included our reach research grade monitor and then we compared this array of different um, consumer monitors. And I don't want to get into the details of which one here, but the, the bottom line is that they all were um, pretty reasonable. Um, this, I, the reason I use this slide is actually funny because in our paper, the, the more of a, a, a research grade paper that we also published on this study, we reported that we were pretty impressed with the devices because most of them were within 10 or 12%. 10, so our criterion better research grade monitor gave an error of 9.3 which is similar to what I reported before. But these other monitors that don't come from a research framework were decent, 10 to 12%. But interestingly, the media, when they pick up this story, they like taking this angle of, does your monitor really work? Or, you know, your monitor has air. Well, of course it has air. Like, tell me something that doesn't have air if you're measuring something. So no device is going to be powerful enough to really precisely calculate every single calorie that you expend. So people have to expect that there's some error. And again, the, the novel thing was that, you know, we reported that the devices were pretty decent and people should feel confident that they're measuring something and that the real goal is if it motivates your behavior. But again, the media picks up on different things and they like taking that angle. So that's right out of a, a story of, of our paper. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the field's very dynamic and new monitors come out all the time. And so this is a whole array of newer monitors that have now moved to the wrist. Some of them were on the waist before, but most of the newer monitors are on the wrist because that's where people want to wear them. And so you've seen the, they emphasize a lot of the, the features and the fit and even the fashion. So really the, the companies are struggling with, do I focus on making it more accurate or do I focus on making it look better or have uh, you know, more functionality? And most of the emphasis is on the function and, and fashion rather than the accuracy. But Again, if they're within 10, 12%, they're doing pretty good. Um, but in, in this, we actually did a follow-up study um, of these devices. I'll show you quick little screen captures, but um, I'm not going to spend much time on it because you've, you've probably seen the ads for all these and see them. But um, this is the Fitbit Flex, for example. It interfaces with your phone, measures steps, distance, calories. Also, a lot of these now track sleep. Um, they do that really with a detecting lack of motion. So I'm questioning the ability to really tell if you're sleeping or not, um, but it's basing it on whether you're, it's detecting any movement or not, which may or may not be a, a good indicator. Um, but this one also has, a, it buzzes if you're sitting too long, which is kind of a, a new trend that they're trying to get you to sit less and move more. Um, the Jawbone Up 24, which was, Jawbone actually bought body media, so the armband monitor that I told you is now, the, a lot of the technology team that work with that is now working for Jawbone. And this has some of the similar features, uh, goal setting features, it buzzes when you're sitting, it also tracks sleep and you know, it has similar interface, so there's very common uh, features. The fuel band, Nike kind of went into the market thinking they'd take it over and then they kind of moved out. I don't even know if they're still selling the fuel band anymore, but um, it was doing some similar things um, that I think were, um, you know, that you've seen like this loop thing, this loop feature is actually embedded in the um, iWatch, 
and I, what I've heard is that I think Nike and um, Apple are in partnership, and so some of the, they went out of the market, and Nike's kind of moving back in, and there's a lot of movement with the uh, Apple iWatch and the health app and things like that, so you're going to see a lot of movement in this area. Um, there's another one, Misfit Shine, that looks more like a watch, but it has, again, some of the same features, so um, this one's waterproof, so you can wear it um, when you're in the water. Um, again, no, no charging, so this one is just continuously on. It ha lasts for six months, and then maybe you need to um, get a different uh, type of battery put in, more like a real watch rather than a chargeable thing that you plug in like your phone. Um, and the Polar, a former heart rate company, has also entered the fray, and, and they've, they've included um, devices, and theirs also includes a heart rate signal, which a lot of the monitors are now doing. So now they've started interfacing with heart rate, and our next study that we're starting this spring will include some of the newer devices, the, the Fitbit Surge, the Jawbone Up 3, and you know, the, a basis is another monitor. So a lot of them are now adding heart rate, which complements, just like I mentioned, the heat signal. The combination of heart rate would give you that same angle of a, an additional channel that would provide a better estimate of energy expenditure. Um, so we, again, in this second study, we tested these newer features and found pretty similar results. We had a, a, a more challenging protocol that it was more real, real life setting. And so the error was a little bit higher, but our body media standard that I mentioned is at 15%. And the, the other device, this is another research grade device. So the body media proved to be the most accurate, but some of these other, other devices were, looked pretty decent. The Fitbit Flex was at 16%, Jawbone up 24, 18%. So we're still in the ballpark, and I still think that's a defensible number. It says that there's something there, that the, the technology is giving consumers a reasonable estimate. I'd be really worried if it was um, a lot worse than that. Um, but overall, I think those are decent numbers for uh, c considering how hard it is to really measure uh, physical activity. But actually in this study we found some interesting patterns. So these are overall error for like a full 60 minute, but we actually stratified the results by three different types of activity they did. They, they were doing some sedentary activities for 20 minutes, then aerobic activity, and then resistance exercise. And what you'll see happening a lot is the error could be anywhere up to 30-40% um, for some of these devices for individual activities, but the error tend to ca tended to cancel out. So what we're reporting here is mean absolute percent error. So if somebody overestimated or underestimated, we still call it error. Um, and the real key here is if the total is good, like 15%, that means that there's some error overestimating and some underestimating and it's averaging out, which should, should make you a little more worried about the device because it means that they're getting to that um, final value by luck, that, you know, that, that some error is canceling out. Um, and this just shows you that it's very difficult to capture sedentary behavior and resistance exercise, which is what I mentioned early on, that the, the other devices, the armband, can tell if you're wearing it, and it can tell heat flux, and so it gives a little bit better precision. So you'll see the armband um, did a lot better for um, lower intensity sedentary activities. It still was worse for resistance exercise because it's very diff difficult to track that, but the, these errors were a lot lower than any of the other products. So again, this is a newer outcome um, that, that casts a different light on, on the monitors. And we're continuing to work on, uh, we have another study again starting up in spring. Um, this was a recent um, interview I just did for uh, Wall Street Journal, just came out this week, so you can search this, fit for motivation, not precision, and they cited our study, and I had to challenge this writer to also not beat that angle of, you know, your monitor doesn't work, and so I, I think she relented and kind of said it's fit for motivation but not precision and so that was a I was okay with that tagline um, but these, these are what the, the monitors can do um, and I think the focus really needs to be on their functionality um, and, and whether they work for each individual so do they does it interface with their phone does it prompt them to be more active and and that that's where the real work needs to be done is do they motivate people and can they be used clinically uh, to help promote behavior change and that's where um, we're sort of going in our uh, next phase. Um, but before I get into that, I wanted to show you some new frontiers in technology. So again, I started with research, then I went into consumer, and this is the third realm of disposable monitors. Um, and this company is actually partnered with Body Media, so that it looks like a fancy Band-Aid, which it is. Um, it's a patch that goes on your arm, just like the armband does, and, but it, and it has all the same channels. So they basically had permission from Body Media to buy that technology, and they did it in partnership made by the same company that makes the post-it notes that we use every day. Um, so they're really good with adhesives, and they did a lot of work trying to figure out an adhesive that would stick to your skin for seven days, and that wouldn't be allergic, that would be, um, if it got wet, it would be okay. And so they've, they've got the best technology of, of an adhesive patch 
that could be worn, and it has the same embedded sensors I pointed out, and it's, um, it's called Metria. You could search that if you like, but it's made by this company, Vansiv Technologies. And um, there's really promising um, links about how it could be used clinically. Um, and again, I'm, the company is very interested in working on this, and I'd be very happy to start some pilots if there's interest um, here. But it describes that there's, again, multiple sensors, 25 different data types, 10,000 minutes of data over one week, and it's being disposable. It could be distributed to patients and mailed back, and then it literally just gets torn open, plugged in, and you have all the data. And so these slides are um, basically from the company's website, and I just have, um, oh, I think it took me somewhere else. I think it's taking me to their website. I didn't think they'd have a clickable link there. Um, it's doing more. There we go. All right, so this is again the patch. So they talk about wearing it 24 7. It's designed for sort of week long monitoring, which is a reasonable length of time to get a, a measure of typical activity from participants. Um, down here. Um, it tracks calories burned, activity level, steps, sleep duration, so it's just like these other devices, but it gives that interface for an individual, but also there's a, a clinical um, interface that would allow the physician or the office group to see what all their participants are, are doing. Um, so this is what their vision is. Um, they focus on assess, which is a baseline. You gain insight, then so after the person wears it for a week, then follow up. Um, recommendations could be made consistent with kind of exercises medicine guidelines perhaps where you develop a plan and then you execute a plan and then you measure progress by maybe having that person wear it again later and so that's kind of the simple approach they took again these are their slides not mine um, and they focus on um, you know this is an example um, that they've, they've even used this with this uh, TV's mission makeover I don't know if anyone's familiar with that I'm not but um, it's another one of these reality shows that it's been used and um, those shouldn't really get, make you very impressed, but um, I think there is a lot of potential um, for this type of technology in medical systems. And we actually tested um, on their behalf. We've done lab testing with it, and this, that's a lovely picture of me there wearing um, the indirect calorimetry system, and you see there's the patch on, above the arm, and then the other monitor is this body media monitor I've told you about. And this is the uh, patch close up that's worn on your arm and again it was very comfortable you kind of forgot you had it on after a while um, but we did some lab testing for a while but I wore it for um, the full week and we looked at how it felt on my arm and um, then we looked at the validity and this is a an agreement in energy expenditure between the two devices and so basically it's giving the same um, estimate if you looked at how close these air or the values are we're within you know 50 calories uh, on average across seven, six seven days and so this is an average of 29 people. And so it's basically the same device as the armband monitor I've told you about, just in a disposable form. So we needed to test this to make sure that that's really holding true. And we also did correlations between the two just to make sure that they're agreeing. And these are correlation coefficients by day. So that means they're correlated at 0.9, um, basically across all six days, meaning they're, they're telling you the same thing in a, uh, in a patch uh, format as the um, purchased research grade monitor is doing. Um, so we're pretty um, impressed with that, and I think there's a lot of potential for um, this type of clinical application. So, I, again, I wanted to share that here. Um, so, again, I'd be happy to forward links to this uh, company if, if there's interest. And um, I'm interested in, you know, facilitating pilot studies because it's the research that I do. So um, I have no stake in the company other than I'm interested in doing the latest and greatest stuff. So um, I wanted to give you a – this is one interesting statistic I, I saw that um, – said, uh, I think it's a statistic that's likely to change, it says there's a poll of 353 doctors and primary care physicians that said only 15% of respondents said they had been asked by their patients about incorporating health data from wearable fitness trackers and apps into medical records. So 15% said um, that patients asked about this and 85 said they hadn't. And I think this is going to be a growing trend as people get more and more data and there's more and more information, they're going to be coming to you and asking you know, is this working, and you know, can I use this as part of my chain, behavior change application, and, and is it working? Um, so it might be a, a trend in the future. Um, so the third component of my talk will be shorter, and this is about health coaching. So I already told you that people don't take the stairs, they take the escalator, and this is another favorite slide of a person that uh, is the dog wants to go for a walk, and they found a way that they didn't have to get out of their chair. 
And this is what we deal with, trying to motivate people to be more physically active. It's not easy. Um, but we've done studies now using some of these uh, consumer tools and, incor and incorporating health coaching with it to see if that would have promise. Um, and so this, again, is the interface of this body media software or product. So they have a, a health coaching tool that we've been using over a number of years that um, shows uh, the consumer. This is sort of what they see. But the, the health coach team, we can also see their data. So as they're wearing it, we can see their data pop up every day. Um, so when they sync it at home, it's also linked to the health coach site. So they have to give our health coaches permission to see the data. And then when we do that, then we can provide feedback electronically and say, good job, it looks like you're wearing your monitor um, and keep up the good work. It also has an associated diet app that they record their food. And so it would give calories consumed. You can look at calorie balance and it gives feedback that they're on a weight loss trend. And so this is, again, the consumer interface of, of this tool. Um, again, I pointed out that it was, uh, this is right off of their website. They show these two people wearing it to track sleep, and it was used on Biggest Loser. And, um, but Body Media has put more of their emphasis now, or again, they were bought by Jawbone, and this particular device is not going to be sold anymore. And so they've sort of have partnered more with Metria as their next generation of work on, with this armband-type patch device. So there's going to be room for innovations in wrist-worn devices like the Jawbone or the Fitbit or any of those other devices, but also, I think, with these patches um, in the future. Uh, let's see the next. So I wanted to share, um, these are findings from our um, first health coach study that um, we tested this product, and we did a randomized controlled trial um, where we took obese people and we randomized them into three different groups. So the one group is called the Bonsante group, and that's a, a standard diet um, weight loss plan where they meet with a dietitian and they follow a diet prescription. It wasn't traditional health coaching per se. Now we've moved into real health coaching with motivational interviewing. This was more of a structured diet counseling approach. Um, so people got um, weekly meetings with their um, dietitian about nutrition activity, behavior modification. Um, the self-monitoring group just got the armband. So we call it the SenseWare armband. So SWA stands for that monitoring technology. And there was minimal health interaction. They met like two or three times with their person just to learn how to use their device. But the person tracked things on their own and used that interface I showed you. The third group got both. They got the Bonsante training and the armband. And you'd expect this group to do the best. Um, we did. And we really didn't see a, a statistically significant difference between the groups. So this just shows we had about 30 participants per group, similar dropout in the three different groups, and about magically. 26 people in all three conditions um, at the end. Um, the overall result showed clinically significant weight loss of about a pound a week in all, all the groups, but no real difference between them. So the Bonsante program worked. People lost about a pound a week. These are in kilograms, so it was an eight-week program. Um, so they lost about four kilograms in this group, about four, and the, the combined group got a little better, but it wasn't statistically significant. Um, but our take from this is that the armband and personal tracking does pretty good on its own, and, and it's a lot more cost effective than having a one-on-one -on -one, um, RD telling a person what they have to do. Um, the combination, I think, is where the action would be, and that I think there is potential to enhance the effect with um, guided behavior change applications or motivational interviewing or prompts, and, and there could be different doses of that. Our current model is an eight-week um, coaching framework that um, is building on this, and we're giving all the participants a monitor, and then we're letting them actually choose whether they want to pursue a diet goal, a physical activity goal, or weight loss goal. Um, and consistent with motivational interviewing, we're also giving them a choice of whether they want in-person or vir virtual health coaching. And it's really interesting to see how people self-assign into those groups. And so we've kind of taken a novel approach to traditional trials where you force somebody into a condition, and we say, we're going to randomize you into this group. We're letting them pick. Um, because we want them to be able to pick what they want and be the most successful, and then we help them create behavior change in either of those three areas. Um, and that trial's still in progress, um, but we'll be doing it this spring. But again, I think a lot of the action is where um, some combination of the technology with um, coaching is probably um, what, where most of the action would be. Um, so I think that's all I had to share with you. Um, our ongoing work is with new, um, this new health coach study. Um, we're doing planned health coaching with this Metria patch um, probably in the fall of next year. Um, and that's uh, about all I have to share. So thanks. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions. Yep, Selden.
<laughs> Your voice is loud enough. Sorry. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, part of the motivation for having you here is for us to figure out a way to uh, assess fitness in our patients. And uh, is, is the conclusion then some type of a monitoring device would you, because I, you know, we've had this conversation before, you know, if you go to Mayo Clinic, they'll get it on a treadmill and measure your metabolic equivalents and, you know, try to give you some measure of fitness that way. And we've talked about the stair step test in the office, but, um, and I got a couple other questions, but what do you think about that? I mean, is that probably the best advice for us I to... Well, I don't think everyone needs a structured exercise test unless they have risk factors, for example. And, um, and the STEP test, I think, is a, a, a useful test. It could be done in three minutes in a clinical setting. Um, I don't know if people would, how they'd react to that in a clinical um, setting. It, it can, can be done. Um, but the, the third option is, and it, this may sound paradoxical, but there's actually what's called a non-exercise um, fitness test and it's based on predictions. And so with thousands of cases of people, um, if, if we know their activity level with a seven point scale, some good measure, that's gonna carry a lot of the variance. And if we know that, we know their resting heart rate, and if you know their waist to hip ratio, and a few other things, their age, gender, you can predict fitness very accurately. So with questions. And so it's, if you really wanna get at fitness and have that be the indicator, that can be estimated with um, self-report question about activity and with a good measure of resting heart rate and that that's one example of a, a powerful tool that could be easily incorporated for okay. fitness well that's great then the, the the next two things that I've been thinking about is first of all is uh, fitness um, you know for us uh, CBC you have a hemoglobin between 14 to 16 I mean is there a range of fitness that is felt to be optimal and then secondly is that something that's almost genetically predicted? I mean, I keep thinking about children I've seen along the way that have no interest in running around, and they are just very idle at the playground, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't know whether they're fit or not fit, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, trying to use activity as a metric for fitness, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about. Well, the, the, there's a genetic influence on everything, and including even physical activity. There's, pre, you know, pre, people predisposed to be active. Um, there's genetic influences on fitness. There's genetic influences on the adaptation of exercise to fitness. Some people will adapt better than others. Um, so the, the real message is not how fit are you, it's what are you doing today? Like what have you done for me lately? And that's where I think physical activity has the advantage because even if you're fit, um, most research is showing that physical activity has an independent effect. And again, that may seem hard to fathom also. M many of you might say, well, exercise just gets you fit and that's really what matters. But physical activity really is having a day-to-day -day benefit on your metabolism, and that's why there's a lot of action now on this, the reducing sitting time. And so if we sit too long, our metabolism kind of slows down and triglycerides get worse, and there's all kinds of research on that, which supports the idea that daily physical activity is still needed regardless of fitness. And so studies have shown independent benefits of activity. So I put my stock in um, promoting physical activity. You can measure fitness either with the methods I talked about or with a self-report measure of activity, um, and th but the activity is what we should be prescribing. Looks like I've answered all your questions.